Okay, today is November 19th, 2022, and it is a gigantic honor to have Tariq Haskins on the show. Tariq is someone that I have long admired and looked up to for his work, dedication, sacrifice, and just for the person and example he's been and continues to be to so many. Tariq is someone that has dedicated his entire life from youth to present to the liberation movement. Tariq is a veteran member of the Black Panther Party here in New York City and the Black Liberation Army and paid one of the highest prices spending 17 years in prison as a political prisoner in direct retaliation for his activism. Tyreek is also a writer, advocate, and continues to educate, organize, and struggle for the freedom of oppressed people domestically and all over the world, and someone that has always been a prominent advocate in the struggle for the freedom of political prisoners. I could go on and on, um, but let's hear it from Tariq directly. Tariq, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a true honor, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. This is very good, Brother Ryan, yes. Um, so just to start off, um, when were you born? I was born in 1948, December 21. Matter of fact, I was birthday coming up real soon. Yes. And I will be 74 years old, yes. Um, and, and where were you born? I was born in Norfolk, Virginia, yes. Uh, and where, where are your parents from? Uh, they are from Norfolk also. My father and my mother from Norfolk. Okay, and did you did you grow up in Norfolk, Virginia? I spent uh, my first nine years in Norfolk, and then uh, I my, I moved with my father to uh, Gary, Indiana, and we lived there for about two or three years. And we left Gary, and we went back to uh, Norfolk for a year, and then we moved to New York. Yeah. And when you moved to New York, uh, where did you live? Uh, Bedford Stuyvesant. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, that was a good experience. Beth Stuyvesant. And, uh, so, and what were your cross streets in Beth Uh, uh Pulaski and uh, uh, Marcy Avenue was a cross street, right? So, and about how old were you when you when you moved to Newark? Twelve years old. Okay. Yeah, I think I was in seventh grade or something. Seventh grade. And you recall Norfolk, uh, Gary, um, and the differences between Norfolk, Gary, and, and Brooklyn? Mm, yeah, uh, Norfolk and Gary, I pretty much lived a segregated life. I was uh, living in a black community. And in Norfolk, I think I was, my generation was the last generation of persons who uh, there was a community um, uh, unity in the community, as it were. And I recall as a child, we went to a person's uh, area and the community was uh, getting together to help this person build a house, mm. you know? And so they erected the whole side of the house and pushed it up. And uh, when I was there and um, created that side of the house while we were there, Matter of fact, uh, they cut a tree down on the person's property, and unfortunately, the tree fell on my brother, but he didn't mm. get hurt. He it fell on his leg, you know, and he was right near a pile of sand. So when when the tree hit his leg, it pushed him into a pile of sand. So he really didn't get hurt. But that was uh, 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 at a time when there was unity in the community, and they actually built much of that person's house that day while we were there. Mm. Uh, so, and I I didn't realize the, I, I, as a young child, I wasn't able to fully appreciate what I had witnessed. It was only years later when I thought back to uh, when we having discussions about unity in the community, collectivism and that sort of thing. That was a demonstration of it, unity in the community, collective uh, work and uh, uh, helping each other out. And does anything stand out about your time in Gary, Indiana? Well, yes, I. Uh, it was particularly cold in Gary, mm -hmm. knee deep snow like they have right now in, in uh, Buffalo. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, I met uh, uh, the Jackson. Uh, I met uh, Tito Jackson. That's mm -hmm. who Tito, Jermaine Jackson. Uh -huh. I used to play with them. And matter fact, Michael Jackson's brothers. Right. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, uh, when I was there, his mother was uh, 
operating her kitchen as a candy store. Mm. And I, I just recently, a few years back, I saw the front of the house in a magazine because the way we used to go to the, the candy store, we used to cut through the yards and go right in the back mm. and go right in the, in the kitchen. And she had Michael Jackson holding her because he was, mm. this was like a 58 when Michael was born. So he was a child, but I did play with uh, Tito and Jermaine and their cousin, uh, they cousin, uh, he's gonna come to me in a minute, but I, I did time with their cousin. Hmm. Uh, I'm trying to think of his name, but I'm, one day I was in a mess hall in Terry Hood and I see this guy, I'm saying, that's that's uh, that's Michael Jackson cousin, you know? And matter of fact, I had a, I had a fight with uh, Tito and Jermaine, we were playing football <laughs> and they said, uh, don't tackle them. I smiled. You don't want to be tackled. You shouldn't play football. Mm -hmm. So I tackled them again, and they both jumped me, and I got them both on the ground. Was beating them up, and uh, the brother pulled me off. Their cousin, he, he pulled me off, and he said, "Y'all don't fight." He was a little older than me, you know, about fourteen or fifteen at the time. And I'm gonna think it, Poochie Gangs. <laughs> That's his name, Poochie Gangs. Yeah, we did time in uh, Terry Hood. And when Poochie came to Terry Hutt, uh, he was able to get the stars there. He was able to get uh, uh, Nat Natalie Cole and other stars to come to the place. Everybody was saying, Poochie is here. Let's get him to get the stars. I don't know why. I was surprised that he had robbed the armored truck and they had killed the guard. But I was surprised because Michael Jackson was making money. I'm saying, why didn't they give him money? You know, But obviously they didn't. That's why he had to go to need to rob an armored truck. Mm. But that was my time uh, spent, the highlight of my time in Gary, Gary in the end. Yeah. And the reason they didn't want you to tackle the, the Jackson brothers was because they were they were already kind of famous? Mm -mm. Oh. They weren't famous at all. They just didn't want to be tackled, you know. They were just uh, talked. Yeah. <laughs> and so they were trying to bully me, to mm. tackle me, you know. So, uh, you don't want to be talking with don't play. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's what happened. Matter of fact, when I was living in New York and they were becoming famous, I didn't know who they said the Jacksons out of Gary, Indiana were becoming famous stars. But one thing I had noticed as a young person living in Gary was up and down the block, everybody's name was Jackson. Mm. Yeah. All the family name was Jackson. This one named Jackson, that one named Jackson, this one named Jackson. Everybody named Jackson. I said, wow, what the hell is this? You know, we in the wrong neighborhood. I'm I'm not a Jackson. <laughs> but they were all named Jackson. I'm saying, what the hell is that? Mm -hmm. But so that's why when they, when they was becoming famous, it's a Jackson. I said, Well, who is that? You know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. What Jackson they're talking about. And so I didn't really look to find out who it was, but then they were saying, uh, Tito and Jermaine, I said, oh, okay, I know them, yeah. you know, yeah. Did you have a sense that they were entertainers at that time? No, I, I, we were kids and Tito used to come to my yard around this time, uh, Christmas time. I remember we, uh, we got our toys and I had them in the yard and he came over and played with my toys, but they were very young. I, I didn't go to their house, you know, mm -hmm. he would come to my house and play with my toys, but I didn't go to their house. And I guess I would have saw them uh, practicing, singing as a group and that sort of thing. So I didn't, because I didn't go to their house, I didn't ever see them practice. I didn't know they were musically inclined and trying to become the stars that they did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you moved to Brooklyn, um, was that something exciting for you? Was that something you were not looking forward to? How was that transition? Well, that was a, uh, a new experience for me because it was a, a integrated situation. You know, uh, there were Puerto Ricans there, and there was still uh, a percentage of, of whites still living in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We used to all play together, uh, play, spin the bottle, pissing, and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, and you know that was a new thing to experience. That you know, that's one of the reasons why I didn't know about racism, you know. My parents didn't tell me and growing up in New York in a mixed neighborhood like that and playing with uh, 
whites and Puerto Ricans. And I didn't know that, you know, uh, from personal experiences that racism uh, was an inner existence, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, why did your family move to Gary and then move to Brooklyn? Uh, poverty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My father got a job. Uh, we uh, left uh, North, moved to Gary. My father had a job at the Liberty Can Company, mm -hmm. you know, which was a big company. And, but he had a job, you know. And I'm, I, I didn't know it at the time, but I uh, studied that period. And that period in Virginia was a very racist period, mm. you know. So that probably inclined them to want to leave also, you know. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, I know that at that time, and, and most of New York, um, the, the gangs were gangs were big in, in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, did, did, were you influenced or did that impact you at all? Yeah, when I came to New York, they had gangs, and I, I didn't know about gangs, you mm -hmm. know. So, uh, so when I moved to New York, uh, the street that we lived on is known as a play street, and that's the street that is blocked off in the summertime. And the police athletic league provide that street with uh, games. Uh, little pool games and uh, little table tennis games and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. checkers and all of that, you know. And so the gangs in the neighborhood would come to that street. Mm -hmm. And and uh, those of us, I met the other brothers and sisters on, on, on the street that I lived on, and we didn't, there was no gang on my street. Mm -hmm. But so the gang used to come in and try to bully those of us on the street. And so those of us on the street who were playing the game, we had to fight the gangs, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that was my introduction to gangs, you know? And, uh, and then uh, we helped, I helped other persons who were being attacked by the gang who lived on my block. They helped me and persons from another block who used to come to our block. We helped them, and that's how we became friends. And then um, a gang that lived nearby us, they didn't bully us like the other gangs did, and that's how I became involved with the gang. I, I got involved with that particular gang because we had to fight the other gangs who come and say, get off the table, I'm playing now, you know, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. yeah. And I, my understanding is that, you know, Black Spades and some of the gangs were a bit more conscious. Was the gang you were involved in a conscious? No, and I wasn't conscious either. I know that uh, Malcolm X's minister of education, a brother named Herman Ferguson, mm -hmm. uh, had sent word, uh, had spoken to, I think, one of our war counselors at the time and told uh, him that uh, we shouldn't be fighting in killing ourselves off. And he, he told us, he called a gang together and he said, yo, I spoke with uh, Malcolm X, Minister of uh, Education, and uh, he said that we shouldn't be fighting. So who the hell is that? <laughs> you know, I was an unconscious person. And would you let somebody tell you what's wrong with you? You the minister, you the walk out somebody telling you, and you gonna tell us what to do? What's, what's going on with this, you know? That was because of my ignorance, you know, but uh, yeah. So Her Herman Ferguson had a very positive impact. Um, uh, well, at the time, I, I just remember that incident, mm -hmm. but I didn't uh, change my behavior mm -hmm. because of that. You know, but I remember that incident. And do you recall around what year this this happened with Herman Ferguson? Oh, uh, it might have been '66 or somewhere around there. You know, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and then at some point um, you joined the military. Mm -hmm. When was that? Uh, that was in 68. In March of 68, I uh, joined the military. And I went there and the person gave me like 20 or 30 days to get my affairs in order. And in the meantime, Martin Luther King was killed. Mm -hmm. So, But I was already obligated to join the service. But what had inclined me to join the service was I had a job. And the guy on the job, uh, one day he 
went out of his role and said, uh, Haskins, God damn it, bring your ass in here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What the hell is he talking to? You know, I was in the process of putting my pants up and I couldn't get him. I had, I was holding my pants up and I said, let me put my pants on, I'll take them down. And then he ran out. Mm -hmm. so, you know, that was not how the kind of relationship we had up, at, up to that point. Mm -hmm. We had a cordial relationship, respectful relationship. And this Haskins, bring your damn ass in. What the hell are you talking to? You know? mm -hmm. So I wasn't looking for the guy. I was going to beat him up, man, because he really upset me. I was sweat popped out of my head. What the hell? What's going on here? You know, I couldn't find him. So I said, listen, mm -hmm. it's good I haven't found him. Just get, get the check and leave, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I said, uh, you know, just just get the check. We'll see his father here. He's, his father was the owner, you know, and the boss, the big boss. And so I said, you know, I don't, it's good I didn't find him. Don't look anymore. Just get the check. Let me get the check. Let me get out of here because I, I can't, uh, you know, I, if I see this guy, I got to hurt him. I can't have people talking to me like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So because of that, I was out of a job and I was thinking about going to college at the time. And I said, well, the military is available because of my ignorance, you know, thinking about college. And that's one would think that uh, I have a certain amount of intelligence. But on the other hand, I'm thinking about going into service. I'm, as a black person, I kind of, what kind of intelligence is that? But mm -hmm. that's what, what happened. So I thought that that was an option. And that option would uh, provide me with tuition to go to college. And I chose to do that. And I went in. Uh, let's say uh, a few days after King was killed. I joined in March, but I really didn't go in until a few days after King was killed. You know? And uh, how old were you? 19. And I, my understanding is you went in on, on, on Mother's Day. Or no. no, you got deployed on Mother's Day. No, I actually went to Vietnam. On Mother's Day. Mother's Day. Yeah. yeah. That's when I was, got off the truck at the base that I was going to be at for Mother's Day. And which um, branch of the military did you join? I joined the Marines. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you have mentioned that, uh, uh, that Martin, Luther, Martin Luther King got killed. Why, why was that significant in terms of, of your thought process at the time? Well, I didn't really know the significance of that. Mm -hmm. of Martin Luther King had been killed and that they were trying to throw water on the aspirations of black people to be free. I didn't know that that was the case. You know, I knew that uh, they had done a, uh, a very impactful thing in terms of impacting a lot of people, all black people. Riots occurred in the uh, neighborhoods and that sort of thing. Much burning down took place in the neighborhoods across the country. I watched it on the news. and. Uh, but in terms of fully appreciating and appropriately appreciating, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. So even though I knew certain things, I was an A student in terms of what they put before me, I did a, get an A in terms of dealing with it. But in terms of knowing what was really going on, I was I was ignorant of that. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that I think oftentimes people don't think uh, talk enough about with Martin Luther King is that he he developed in, into becoming an internationalist and he developed into becoming anti-war mm -hmm. um, and, and so that was something and the, that was leading up to his assassination mm -hmm. yeah and that's the and, and and it's that part of him that uh enough uh light is not shined on mm -hmm. you know they say he was a civil rights leader and he was um uh, uh, trying to give black people civil rights, but he he was at the point of having become an internationalist, and he had pointed out that in terms of violence, the American government is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. You know, mm -hmm. and so America, and and basically to me, he was saying that America is Guatemala mm -hmm. under Rio Smart. That's really America. America is Nicaragua when the conscious was killing and disappearing people. That's America mm -hmm. for real. That's what he was saying. And I'm sure that the, the racist uh, authorities were outraged that he, he would uh, take that position, you know. 
And a, a lot of people don't know when King was alive, there were a lot of ministers was trying to tell him, look, don't slow down, don't do this and don't do that, you know, because the authorities were pushing them to try to dissuade him to not uh, publicly say the things that he was saying in terms of letting people really know what America is, you know. Uh, there's no American dream for black people. Mm -hmm. There's no, it's only like Malcolm say, there's no American dream, there's only American nightmare. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's what thing Trump just pointed out to the American people. He said, the American dream is dead. Mm -hmm. And he said he's gonna try to make America great again, but that's a lie. But he did point out that the American dream is dead mm -hmm. for all Americans. But for black people, it has been dead uh, it, it never had life, mm -hmm. you know, just a myth, embracing a myth. And going back to your time in the Marines, uh, you joined in Brooklyn and, and where did you end up? Well, I first uh, went to, after, after completing boot camp in South Carolina, and then I went to another training thing in, in North Carolina, part of, part of all persons joining the Marines after go through the infantry thing. And so I went to my infantry thing in South Carolina and North Carolina. And then I went to Memphis, Tennessee to be trained for the job that I was going to do. And the job I was going to do was to be a uh, gas turbine technician, a, a, a jet engine mechanic. Mm -hmm. And so I learned one engine in Memphis, Tennessee. And then I had to go to uh, Jacksonville, Florida to learn another engine. Okay. And did you ever, uh, uh, I guess I, I uh, uh, spoiled this qu next question, but did, uh, did you ever get deployed to Vietnam itself? Right, I did. Uh, I, you know, a uh, person would volunteer to go. I didn't want to volunteer to go. Mm -hmm. But the commander of the Marines said that all persons who hadn't been would be sent. And thereafter, I was sent to Vietnam. Uh, I was sent to a place called uh, Chula, Vietnam. Mm. Yeah. And um, it was Mother's Day of what year? Uh, 1970. Okay. And what were uh, conditions like? Well, I was a, uh, being in the air wing, I was uh, the only black you know, there was like two or three blacks, hundreds of whites and two or three blacks. And I was one of the two or three blacks. But the situation, I know uh, I was put on patrol and the reason why I was put on patrol, and that's what the question you're talking about. Uh, I was, uh, when I went to my shop, the shop head said that he had one nigga in the shop, he's not having another one. So they put me out on, he put me in a unit that went out on patrol I went out on patrol, got off the truck, and uh, we were walking around, and I seen all these people was hurt up. Every, you know, almost everybody had a cut or a burn somewhere and stitches here. And I was so naive. I'm thinking, like, is that, what, is it, are we near a hospital grounds or something? Mm. Are these people being let out to walk around or something? What's going on? And so, but that's the, ex the percentage of persons who have been hurt because the French occupation, the Japan, Japanese occupation, the French occupation, the American occupation, a lot of people have been hurt of, you know, and uh, and it was visible with the scars they had on them, you know. So that's what I was witnessing when I first uh, got off the truck. Yeah. And um, and you saw you saw combat. Yeah, mm -hmm. I saw combat. Uh, um, matter of fact, the, the unit I was in. We was like backup uh, situation because the base I was on, they had a patrol going around the base, a constant patrol going, it was an air base. And the persons could shoot the planes down if they get near, you know, the perimeter. Mm -hmm. Because the plane would be just getting like 20 feet up, you know, when they go over the fence, you know. So mm -hmm. if they get near that, they could shoot the plane down with, with no problem. And so they had patrols going around, and when the patrols would uh, encounter someone, they would call uh, backup, and we would go. 
I was either in the patrols or the backup. And when a shootout would occur, they would call backup and would go there and join in the shootout like that. You know? mm -hmm. And and then I was uh, put on perimeter guard. Uh, part of that detail involved being put on perimeter guard. And I was on perimeter guard and we had shootouts with the person who would come and shoot, shoot at the base and attack the base and that sort of thing, yeah. And was there, I mean, I guess you kind of alluded to this, but was there racism in uh, in the Marines while you were in Vietnam? Yes, it was racism. Uh, um, it was racism. As I said, the first encounter was a person saying he had one nigga in the shop and he didn't want to have another one. So he put me out in the field and uh, the field was uh, mainly white guys, and I would see white guys who didn't like black guys. And at one point, a sergeant intended to kill me, you know. So he, we went to a, responded to a shootout situation, and we got off the truck, and he said, Joe, Bob, you, you go that way, and Haskin, you go that way. I said, what? Everybody else going that way. I'm going this way. And I know you are racist. I know how racists are. And killing uh, people is not a problem for racists. It's a very easy thing, a flipping thing. I said, what? I should go that way? I said, okay. Let me load my gun up. I loaded my gun up. And then I, I looked at him and I let him know. I said, listen, I'm going to stay right here. You know. But he intended for me to go that way so he could kill me. Mm. Yeah, but that, that's what the deal was. But I knew that that was what the deal was. So if there's going to be killing, it's going to be killing right here. Mm -hmm. So I let him know I'm not going nowhere. Yeah, my gun was loaded, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't care nothing about it. I'm racist, you know. So he said, okay, all right, okay, all right. And he went. They went somewhere else, wherever they went, and uh, had a shootout with the guys and chased him away. But when we got back on the base, he pulled his gun on me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And people saw him pull his gun out. And there was one that they started running because they saw him pull his gun out. And he said, Haskins. And they said, oh, shit. You know, and I was about to take the bullets out of my gun. So, well, I had took it out and I, I put it right back in. And, and and then they saw who he had took the gun out for. And everybody was running away because I was going to shoot him then once he took his gun out. I was just going to shoot him, but people kept running in the way, and then he ran, you mm -hmm. know, so that's why I didn't shoot him. But they arrested me for that, but uh, I got arrested for that, and I went to the court thing, you know, whatever that, you know, the court thing. Like a court martial type thing? Yeah, it's like, it, it wasn't really a court martial, but it was like a court thing. Mm -hmm. And so the guy says, uh, ask you, you and Joe, I had a little problem. So I'm gonna give you a thirty dollar fine. You can go. Mm -hmm. so I'm saying what? I'm I'm really telling my friends. Listen, I'm going to the brig for attempted murder. Mm -hmm. All of this, you know. I th I stayed in jail one or two days uh, before they the court martial. This was in Vietnam, mm -hmm. right? Right. Uh, and so the guy said we had a little beef, and uh, I'm giving you a thirty dollar fine. But I I was at, at the time I I, I I couldn't understand that, you know. Uh, that was a very lenient right, uh, sentence. sentence, right? I'm saying, what's going on? With I couldn't make it out. I couldn't articulate what had took place. Mm -hmm. And it was years later that I was able to see that really the government was, you know, down with that. Mm -hmm. And they didn't really want to have a full discussion of that mm -hmm. and really shine light on that whole thing, what was going on. And so that's why they said, well, it's a $30 thing. You can go just mm -hmm. like that. So I told my friends, you know, and but they sent the guy off to, to another base. My friend uh, let me know that he had been sent to another base, but uh, that was indicative of uh, one of the incidents of racism that I experienced there, a screen case. I experienced another time, matter of fact, uh, the Ku Klux Klan got me alone one night in the mess hall. In Vietnam. Mm -hmm. wow. And that place, Chulai. I was sitting there facing the wall, 
And about 20 of them came, and I was the only black in the mess hall. I didn't know it at the time. I was just sitting there eating my food. And uh, they came in, and they said, uh, hell with niggas, kill all niggas and stuff. So I'm saying, like, they're talking all loud. I have a vaccine. I'm saying, well, must be some black guy. I see them saying mm-hmm. that. Uh, some black guys matter. Some other black guys, mm-hmm. you know, kill all niggas and hate niggas. And shit. So I, but it kept going. I said, I'm going to turn around. So oh, it's the Ku Klux Klan. Wow, it was them. Long story short, I went up there to staff. I said, they're going to think I'm going to come up there and talk about, oh, can we all get along? This is bad. Or no, I was going to go up there and staff. I had hoped. I said, the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to staff three or four of them before they really realize what's going on. Mm-hmm. But when I went up there, I took the knife. I had a knife. But in the mess hall, you can't bring knives and guns in, in the public place in mess halls and and uh, in the stores, uh, commissary, you can't bring it in commissary, mess hall, in the bar, you can't, mm-hmm. the bar, the base, you can't bring guns and knives in there. But I had my knife on me, so mm-hmm. yeah, had a Swiss plate on, big old, big one like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I got up there, ultimately I got near them, I pulled it out, but one of them had walked over, over away from the other ones he saw the knife and he started screaming he got a knife i turned to look at him they started pushing tables on me and i couldn't i couldn't stab none of them mm-hmm. you know and and i chased them out I, I pushed the table back i said i'm gonna stab i let them know but well, you got the right guy alone now you know i know about y'all mm-hmm. i know how y'all be uh bullying black people catch them alone i said well you got the right guy alone now mm-hmm. I'm gonna stab three or four of y'all before y'all know what's going on. So I I chased them out of them, I saw them. Mm-hmm. And the hippies, some hippies was there. They saw it and they let the black guys know what happened and let the other hippies know. And uh, that I was, that's how I became famous in the Marines uh, for having chased the uh, Ku Klux Klan out of them, that's all. Mm-hmm. I chased them, ran them, but they was running pretty fast. So I said, I'd rather go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you know that's what that's what happens to black people, and that is why we are in the subservient. Black people are in the subservient position that we are in, because everybody knows that they will get you alone in the military or wherever, on the farm, and get you alone and mob up on you, and you won't have the wherewithal to fight against them. But I, I was willing to in my life so i didn't worry about uh, what was going to happen you know i just said you, you know you, you're bullying the right trying to bully the right person now mm-hmm. so that's why i chased them out of there you know yeah yeah man and look for me in the whirlwind the the book about the panther 21 mm-hmm. and their biographies they um uh, they all talk m- many of them serve time in, in the military and many mm-hmm. of them or pre- pretty much all of them have similar had had similar experience mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. dealing with that level of racism, which mm-hmm. led to fights, if, if not worse, mm-hmm. um, while while in the military, whether it was stateside or abroad. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, how long were you in Vietnam for? Uh, nine months. I got kicked out. You know, mm-hmm. and what happened was they they called this black guy who was coming down the road. And some white guys were standing in front of their house, and he came by, and they was calling him the N-word, nigga, this, this, that. So I said, okay, they only call you names. We'll just go by there one night and have a talk with them while they sleep, you know. So we went by there, about 40 of us, and I said, put six people around each bed and then cut the light on, and then we'll wake them up. We cut the light on, woke them up. So I said, listen, we had a black guy came by here. And somebody from here called him a, a nigger. It's not the thing to do. We don't want to have that to happen to him again. Because when we come back, it's going to be a different story. We cut the light out, we left. So they was terrified. Once they woke up and saw all these blacks, six guys around East Bed, they was just terrified. So I got arrested for that. And I was charged with uh, uh, assaults. What are the charges? Six assaults or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the assault thing was uh, the way the child read, the statute read an assault 
uh, when you make a person cringe, mm -hmm. and you that is a physical impact and on a person, and that constitutes assault. Mm -hmm. But they were all cringing and like that, and that's what the guy was telling me that constituted assault, mm -hmm. and that's why I was charged with assault. But the guy, uh, the military person, the authority person, gave me the choice: I could either get out in a week or uh, go to trial. So I said, I'll take the week out. You know. I got all my benefits. I got a general and an honorable. And they put the word out to anybody who know Haskins, who mm -hmm. know me, just come in and say, you know Tyreek, and you could be out in a week. Mm -hmm. I had my partners, they went in and so I told them. He told me and he said, I'm gonna put the word out, anybody who know you. And I told my partners and they put the word in, they went in and got out, you know. And why do you, why do you think that they, they wanted people out with that type of consciousness? Uh, well, they they didn't really want, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the jails was full of black militants. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the military, the, uh, the military mm -hmm. jail, yeah. Matter of fact, the guy who gave me this here, this is a unity band from that we used to wear, the soldiers used to wear in Vietnam. And the guy who gave me this, he was a, a former prisoner of uh, LBJ, and that's. Uh, I know it sounds like many things, Johnson. Mm -hmm, that's what I was thinking. It's uh, Long Bend Jail. That was where the military mm -hmm. prison was located. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of black guys who were uh, militant and serious guys, you know. Uh, so they didn't really want to keep filling those places up with persons who was uh, very serious, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So you got dishonorable. You got honorable discharge. Mm -hmm. I mean and came back to the U.S. Right. Um, and and I guess when did um when did you first get involved in activism? Okay, let me say this. Yeah, but, go ahead, my bad. Uh, <laughs> I got the discharge, but the racists had hooked it up. They marched me off the base mm -hmm. with a gun and everything. And the sergeant marched me off the base and told me in the middle of the street and said, the government property ends here. You got to step across this line and you off the government property in the middle of the street in uh, Oceanside, California. And that was really a racist thing. Told me not to come on the base. That was a lie. Mm. Never come on the military base again. You were prohibited from coming. That was a lie, all a lie. Mm. Know? Yeah, because I went on the military base and got all my benefits. I, I listened. So tell me that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so my military. Uh, I just want to end with that note yeah, no, on the military. You. But when I got out, uh, while I was in, I had been uh, seeing uh, news reports about the Black Panthers, you know, mm -hmm. and they were doing what I felt that Black people should do. They had organized themselves, and they the, the Panther organization was addressing all the, the Black people's issues, you know. Uh, they, they had formed a a group of persons who would represent them and then they was providing for uh food and clothing for black people uh they were uh providing protection for the elderly so they could get their checks and all that sort of stuff and escorting them here and there uh they provided uh as i say the food uh bags of food and then they had the free breakfast program they had a sickle cell testing program so i was I had uh, become aware of the Panthers from watching the news, and I've seen them several times on the news, you know. And so my intent was to join them once I got back, got out, you know. And so when I got out, I uh, before I could go to their office, I had learned that a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, had joined the Black Panthers. And so I wanted to get with him and then go, but I didn't find him, so I wanted to join the Black Panthers, yeah. And my understanding is that there were Panthers in Vietnam. Is, is that accurate or? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'll keep uh, I, I didn't, interrupting you while you try to drink. <laughs> no, 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 I, I didn't, uh, I didn't encounter any in the, in, uh, in the military, mm -hmm. but it's very possible, you know, so persons who have become aware and were already in the military, mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking that once a person uh, know learn the information provided by the Black Panthers, they would no longer want to involve themselves in the American military. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
but it's possible on the side. No, no. And when you came um, uh, back from Vietnam, you went back to New York City? Right. I came right back here. Yeah. And I went to the uh, Panther office. And the Panther office, one of their offices was located on DeKalb and Marcy. And that, and they particular office was uh, a formal pool room that I used to hang out in. So mm. I went there, I knocked on the door and a brother named Raheem came to the door and uh, we were talking and a, a police helicopter pulled up right in the middle of the street. Mm. Yeah, and a guy got out on the rail and took our picture. Yeah. And the helicopter landed or just hovered over? It hovered over the, down the block, you know, like we hear, they mm -hmm. got down the block, uh, rooftop level, all the buildings there was like two stories, mm -hmm. and two or three stories, and over just above that, and a guy got out on the back rail and stood there and took our picture. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so you joined that day? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and um, I, 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 you had alluded to this, the the, you know, um, some of the programs that the Panthers offered, because I think oftentimes people, when they think of the Black Panthers, they think of, you know, black leather jackets and, mm -hmm. and, and rifles and, mm -hmm. and rigorous self-defense. Um, but the Panthers offered a multitude of programs and, and self-defense was really just one of, mm -hmm. of countless programs. Is mm -hmm. that, is that, that That's correct. Uh, as I said, they had the uh, sickle cell testing program they had the free food giveaway. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to interact with all of the, in the programs because I was going to college at the same time. Mm -hmm. I was going to college and working. So I would just run by and see what's happening and get papers. Mm -hmm. You know, I would buy a number of papers to give them out. I suppose to sell them, but I would buy them, you know, because I wanted people to have the information I'd give them out mm -hmm. when I went to college, yeah. So you had they had uh, provided housing uh, support, you know, housing defense, the Panthers. So, so someone had housing problems. Well, yeah, they uh, they uh, work with tenants mm -hmm. and tenant unions. Yeah, and help to address uh, the complaints that the tenants had in dealing with uh, the landlords. And they would be there to intercede uh, for the tenants with the landlords and that sort of thing. Um, education, political education programs. Right, the political education program. I was trying to sit in on the classes when I was able to, you know, and, uh, learn what I could. Yes. And where um, where were you studying, and, and what were you studying when you came back? Oh, I went to uh, uh, Mega Evers College, and I should say I was. Uh, registered for college by Al Van. He just recently passed. He's a good brother. And Jitu Wiusi, Big Black, he just passed mm -hmm. also. But they were had an organization known as the Black Teachers Alliance. And I was able my, my partner hooked me up with them and they registered me for college. I was one of the first to attend uh Mega Mega Evans College. I became a member of the student body. And as a member of the student body, we had an audience with uh, uh, Charles's brother, uh, uh, Mega's brother, name was Charles, mm -hmm. right? Charles Evans, yeah. We had an audience with him. And he told us about him, uh, how he was trying to encourage his brother to take security measures in light of uh, Mega being a principal person in the civil rights movement. And he thought that it would be appropriate if he took uh, security measures, but we did, you know, so, yeah, but I, I so tend to Mississippi and the, the struggles that Meg Rappers went through and his brother Charles in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And Big Black was one of the leaders in Attica Rebellion. No, I know that Big Black, oh, but okay. uh, <laughs> Big Black was a, uh, at the time, I think he was assistant principal at a school and uh, Al Van was a uh, teacher, I think. And he later became a uh, city council person and uh, uh, a state legislator. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he did that for a long period of time. And they were 
uh, principal players in terms of trying to improve the black educational situation here in New York and around around the country. 